Friends, welcome once again to our online worship here at the First Baptist Church of Freehold. I am Reverend Jonathan Elsenson, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all on this joyful Pentecost Sunday. Today is a day in the life of the church when we remember the birth of the church, when we remember the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out upon the disciples in Jerusalem that gave them the ability to spread the gospel to all lands as they had been commanded. So come join us in celebration this morning. Come as we celebrate God's presence still moving in our lives. Join me in prayer as we begin. Come Holy Spirit, the wind of God, the breath of life. Come Holy Spirit, our advocate, our counselor. Come Holy Spirit, our teacher of wisdom, our reminder of Christ. Come Holy Spirit, our grantor of forgiveness and our giver of peace. Come Holy Spirit, may we feel God breathing through this worship. May we receive the Holy Spirit this day. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is, O oh, Worship the King, All Glorious Above. Seeking first your kingdom. 
Grant us the spirit of wisdom that we may aspire to things that last forever. Teach us today to be your faithful disciples and animate us in every way with your Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, we have several announcements from here at the church, the most pertinent of which concerns our advisory board meeting, which was held last Sunday. During that time, the advisory board uh, examined the conditions on which we meet for worship and determined that it was time for us to return to an all indoor schedule. So starting today, we will be indoors uh, for the foreseeable future. Masks are still required and social distancing will still be preserved. Uh, we have also done away with temperature checks at the door as we felt those weren't uh, really as effective as we once believed they may have been. So uh, for those of you who are comfortable, please join us for worship. And those of you who are not yet ready, please rest assured that we will continue producing these online services um, until the time we move into a live streaming model, but that won't be for several months, and at that point, you'll be able to tune in as service is happening and join us for worship then. But we plan to keep pre-recording these for at least the summer and maybe the remainder of the year. Uh, for those of you who have young people uh, in your lives and wish to have them vaccinated, uh, both Centra State and uh, the borough here have moved into a uh, walk-in model for their vaccinations. Central State Hospital continues to have Pfizer vaccine, which is available to any child 12 and up, and the borough here uh, at the firehouse uh, is working on getting that as a more regular stream of the vaccines that they're being sent. So if you have uh, a child 12 or up in your household, uh, please reach out to the church and we'll point you to the nearest uh, distribution time that you can bring them to. Uh, today, following worship, our deacons will be having their meeting. So if any deacons are watching from home, you should have received a Zoom link uh, from Becky this week. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you after this. Uh, next week on Wednesday, we will not have our Bible study as we will be having the final uh, Children of God uh, discussion group in this particular series. Uh, that will be meeting at 7 o'clock, and we will be discussing the importance of water in our faith traditions. Uh, if you're interested in that, the midweek and Sunday emails that contain links on how to find this service will have a Zoom link that you can click on. You're going to need to pre-register for this, so click the link that will register uh, you for the, for the talk, and then you'll receive a follow-up email with the link to the actual event itself. And finally, uh, this is your absolute last chance to get things in for the June issue of The Caller. We're going to have that out sometime midweek, and we uh, hope to get that out in a timely fashion. So if you have any lingering information, please get that in ASAP. And with all of that said, let's take some time now to speak to our young people. Before we have our lesson this morning, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what you see me wearing. Have you ever wondered why I wear these pieces of fabric around my neck? Uh, it's been tradition in Christian churches that pastors wear robes, uh, and oftentimes they wear these pieces of fabric, which are called stoles. And they generally signify that someone 
has under, undergone the preparation that is required to become a pastor. So I wanted to tell you about this one. I usually wear this one, and sometimes I change them to match the, uh, the fabric that you see here in the church, which are associated with different seasons in the life of the church. And as you see today, our fabric is red because red symbolizes Pentecost. And when I was ordained, when I was told that I had completely prepared myself to become a pastor, they gave me this stole, which is also red and orange. And they gave it to me because they acknowledge that when you are prepared to be a pastor, you have received some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And today, we celebrate the gifts of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost. So before I tell our story, I'm actually going to switch my stole to this one as a reminder of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are bestowed not just on me, but on everyone, and that we celebrate during Pentecost. After Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples were waiting in a house. Suddenly a sound like wind filled the entire house. The disciples looked around and saw little flames of fire on each of them. It was the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit that would be with them always. The disciples began to speak other languages. They were all surprised, and some asked each other, what does this mean? People outside the house heard the noises. What is happening, the people wondered. Peter told the people, God has sent the Holy Spirit to us. That is what you have heard. The people listened to Peter. He told them about Jesus. Peter helped people to believe in Jesus and told them to be baptized. The Holy Spirit will be given to you, Peter told the people. The people believed and were baptized. So Peter and all of the other disciples received the gift of God's Holy Spirit, and their first impulse is to share it with other people, to tell them about the great things that Jesus has done in the world and in their lives, and to encourage other people to follow Jesus. So this week and this day, as we celebrate the gifts of the Spirit that God has given to us, I wonder what you might tell someone about what God has done in your life. I wonder how you would feel about sharing that gift with your friends, your family, kids at school, your relatives, whoever. So this week, I pray that you will understand some of God's gift in your life, and that each and every one of you is a gift to this church, and that we celebrate this day as well. Take care, guys, and we'll see you next week. As we come into a time of prayer, before we lift up members of our own congregation, I'd like to bring uh, to your attention a prayer concern that was shared with me by Roy Medley. Uh, Roy forwarded on a prayer request and update from Bader Mansour, who uh, was the General Secretary of the Baptist Church in Israel. Uh, Bader writes to us and to all Baptists uh, at the outbreak of further violence in Gaza and Sheikh Jarrah. He writes that we are in the middle of yet another round of violence of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which comes this time after one year of lockdown because of COVID-19. It also came during a very unstable political situation in Israel, four elections in only two years, and the cancellation of elections in the Palestinian Authority. Currently, the Israeli Air Force is bombing the Gaza Strip, and the Gaza Strip, controlled by militant group Hamas, is firing rockets into Israel, and there is lots of destruction and many lives have been lost. There is also a lot of unrest in the West Bank and Jerusalem. What is happening inside Israel is very alarming. Arabs and Jews in Israel are projecting a lot of anger through rioting and looting, which have been going on for a week, and some of the worst sides of hatred have spread from both sides. Many innocent people have been attacked and beaten, and few people were killed. Businesses and homes were burnt down or vandalized, and extremists are trying to terrorize innocent people who do not feel safe even inside their own homes. The situation continues to be dangerous. In addition to the loss in lives and property, we are mostly concerned for the spread of hatred and the destroying of coexistence that was built with lots of hard work. After all this will stop, it will take years to build what was destroyed. Psalm 11, verse 3, 
tells us that if foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We weep, writes Bader, with those who are weeping and empathize with all who are suffering. We have called our churches for three-day fasting and prayer for our country. We continue to pray as we call you to stand with us in prayer. We have the following specific prayer requests. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, including all its inhabitants in all surrounding areas, for both Israelis and Palestinians. Pray for leaders and all those in authority that they may pursue peace, so we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Pray for healing of relationships between Jews and Arabs, especially for our young people who are exposed to this type of hatred for the first time. Pray for protection for our churches, communities, and families. Some churches had to cancel their services or hold them online because of fear. Pray especially for Haifa, Acre, Lod, Rami, Jaffa, Cana of Galilee, Turan. Pray for us to remember to turn our eyes to God, our refuge and our strength, and to Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Pray for us to live our faith by loving our neighbors as ourselves, and have faith to continue being a prophetic voice amid the chaos and light amid the darkness. Thank you for standing with us in prayer. So this morning in our prayers, let us hold all of the people of Israel, of Palestine, of the Middle East in our prayers. We also want to lift up members of our own communities. I had the opportunity to visit Carolyn Duckett on her birthday this past week, and she re reports that she is doing as well as can be expected. She is on the road to recovery, but still has a way to go. So we continue to lift Carolyn up in prayer. We pray also for Jack and Barbara Huff uh, as uh, they are managing Barbara's health difficulties. We continue to pray for Chris Tomlinson, who was briefly readmitted to the hospital earlier this week. We pray for Mar Fuss and for Nancy Coleman, and we hold up all those who are in need. So let us pray this morning. Let us join our hearts together as we turn to the God who knows and loves us. Loving God, we give thanks for all of the ways that you bless our lives. The beauty and abundance of nature, the love of family and friends, the joy of knowing you and hearing your word. We pray that you would send your spirit during this time of worship so that we might dream your dreams and see visions of the world as you created it to be. Guide our thoughts and actions. Bring us closer to you so that we might do your will and dwell in your kingdom forever. And so we turn to you now, opening up the prayers that we carry within our hearts. Too often, Lord God, we are hesitant in our proclamation, seeking safe and suitable opportunities to speak of our faith. Too often, Lord God, we are half-hearted in our service, reluctant to stand out from the crowd or to attract criticism. Too often, Lord God, we live as if dependent wholly on our own resources, relying on our perceived skills and our own modest insights. Too often, Lord God, we look to the skies for our inspiration in the vain hope of finding you there. So forgive the poverty of our efforts and the frailty of our faith, and open wide our hearts and minds to your imminent, eternal presence. So come, Holy Spirit, the one who sang a new melody as God's creation rose from chaos 
who wept at the dark shadow of a cross, and who danced early in the morning at the opening of an empty tomb. Come, Holy Spirit, the one who could not be contained by wind or flame or breath, the one who blesses the church with courage and peace and love. Come, Holy Spirit, to us who gather this day with trembling hands and uncertain hearts. Teach us to sing a new song and to speak with voices made strong by your presence. Here in this gathering of believers, wherever we find ourselves, as you did so long ago, breathe on us now. Breathe on us, blowing away our fears and our hesitations. Breathe upon us, transforming our hard-heartedness into passion-filled lives. Breathe upon us, for we need the peace that only you can give. We ask all of these things in the name of our risen and ascended Lord, who told us to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, and who taught us to pray with one another, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is, Come Holy Spirit, Heavenly Dove. Medes, 
Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Sinai, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. <clears throat> Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our second lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, starting on the second chapter. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Here ends our reading from God's Word. May God bless and magnify it to our use.
does Pentecost mean to you? It is a day when we decorate our churches in red vestments and accoutrement. It's a time when we celebrate the birth and the beginning of the church. When I was a young child, my home church used to release red balloons on Pentecost. And so the service would culminate with us going outside to let go of these balloons that would fly up into the sky. I also learned that year that you shouldn't release balloons into the sky because they come down into the ocean and mess up the lives of sea turtles who think they are jellyfish. So we stopped doing that. But that still leaves us with the question, what does Pentecost mean to you? What does Pentecost mean to the church? Is it more than simply celebration? Is it more than simply remembrance? There's a Hebrew concept referred to as tikkun olam. And what that really means is the repairing of the world. Observant Jews believe it is the responsibility of all of God's children to repair the world, to make the world a better place. And I think that is a fitting sentiment for us this Pentecost Sunday. For Pentecost memorializes the birth of the church and showcases their efforts to attempt to repair or heal a world that was very broken. Pentecost, writes Diana Butler Bass, Pentecost is our noisiest holiday, a party, the birthday of the church, celebrated with banners and red balloons and cake. We hear rushing wind, tongues of fire, and cacophonous crowds. We reenact Acts 2 in multiple languages, reminding us that God sent all humankind as a gift. The Spirit with its promise of peace and portents of salvation for the healing of the earth. But before we get into the meat of what Pentecost is, we need to begin where we ended last week with the disciples waiting. Last week we celebrated Jesus' ascension, his ascension into heaven, marking the period of his bodily resurrection on earth, coming to an end. And as Jesus ascends to take his place at the throne of God, he tells the disciples that they are to wait. They are to wait together in Jerusalem for the arrival of the Holy Spirit. This year, given all that has happened since our lives were upended by the pandemic last March, I think we can understand better than ever the weightiness of the waiting that the disciples are engaged in. We know what it means to wait with expectation for things to change. The disciples were accustomed to waiting, but none of it seemed very pleasant. They scattered, fleeing the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that Jesus was betrayed and captured. They hid in the darkness. They were scattered on Easter morning when Mary Magdalene and the other women found the tomb empty. And even after finding the tomb empty, they hid themselves away in an upper room with locked doors, or fled the city for places such as a maze. Waiting for the disciples was a stressful, harrowing time. But then Jesus comes to them. He puts their fears to rest. He teaches them. He opens the scriptures to them. And just as quickly as he comes, he leaves. And they are told once again to wait. We have all become accustomed to waiting this past year. Waiting in our homes in the early days of the pandemic when we were all locked down. We wait in six foot lines in grocery stores. We waited for businesses to open or travel to become safe. We waited to celebrate weddings or memorialize
as those we had lost. We waited to hold our friends and family close. We waited for vaccines to be developed and delivered. We waited for the number of cases to drop. We, like the disciples, know what waiting means. But waiting for them was not simply a matter of biding time. It was a time for them of preparation. They were told to wait together, to continue to pray and learn and offer praises to God. That time of waiting and preparation allowed them an opportunity to let go of what was their life as they understood it as followers of Jesus, and prepared them for the new life that was before them, not disciples, but apostles, those who were sent out to share the good, uh, the good news, not simply to follow, but soon to lead. The disciples needed this time to say their goodbyes to Jesus, who was lost and then found, and then gone again. They needed this time to say goodbye to the way that things had been for them. They needed that time to prepare themselves for what was to come. All of that noisiness and hubbub and miracle that Diana Butler Bass characterizes at being at the heart of our Pentecost celebrations. When we talk about Pentecost, we talk about the miracle of it. We tend to focus on the tongues of fire rushing down from heaven in a mighty wind. We talk about the gift of tongues, the disciples able to speak in the languages of a multitude gathered around them. Maybe we even talk a little bit about that claim that they were drunk on new wine at nine in the morning. But we don't as often ask what the gifts of Pentecost were for. We don't as often ask why the gift was given. There's a natural answer contained within the scripture. Peter and the others gained the ability to speak to members of all the nations. They gained the ability to speak to Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. That exhaustive list covers what was considered the known world at that time, or at least a decent approximation of it. The miracle seems to be that they were able to speak in the language of others, that people were able to hear the good news about God's power and promise in their own language. And that is indeed miraculous. But without those deeds of power they spoke of, the ability to speak in countless languages is no more meaningful than a card trick. I always have to laugh a little bit when uh, they, uh, the, the, the people gathered in Jerusalem who hear the disciples speaking say that uh, they're filled with new wine. I used to be a bouncer, and while I can confirm that uh, those who've had a little too much new wine do indeed speak in tongues, they are not ones that are appreciable to you or to me. Peter speaks not with the words of a drunkard, but clearly and concisely. He offers the prophecy of Joel, and he breaks open the words for those who are gathered there, as Jesus did for the disciples on the road to Emmaus and in the upper room. He shows them what was within the scriptures, scriptures that would have been familiar to all of them. He shows them a world where sons and daughters prophesy, where old men dream dreams, where God's Holy Spirit is poured out upon all. It takes Peter and the others a while to truly come to terms with this. They continue doing what they've done, teaching, healing, praising God. But the later chapters of Acts see them struggling 
with sharing this good news outside of Jerusalem with, with people who are unlike themselves. I think Peter and the others needed that time between Ascension and Pentecost to process and understand more fully what the gift of the Holy Spirit would do to them, what, what changes it would wreak in their lives. It takes time for Peter to understand that the gift of the Holy Spirit is open to Gentiles like the centurion Cornelius. It takes Peter time to understand that the gift is open to zealous opponents of Peter and his friends, like the Pharisee Saul, who would one day come to be called Paul the Apostle. Pentecost is the inverse of the Tower of Babel found in the earliest parts of our scripture. A time when humans attempted to build a temple with steps to heaven. And God saw their work and decided to confuse their speech, leading them to abandon their work. The Lord says, look, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples and allows them once again to speak in one language with one voice, is the culmination of that prophecy. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. In the hands of the disciples, nothing they propose is impossible not even turning enemies like Cornelius into friends, not even turning their greatest persecutor into one of their greatest apostles. This is what we talk about when we talk about Pentecost, but there's one piece I want to bring to the fore this morning. There is another function of the Holy Spirit that is understood in the Gospels, but not quite centered and focused on in this section from Acts. And it deals with the name and the function of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus promises to the disciples in the Gospel of John that there will be another coming, he names it for them in Greek, the paraclete. Paraclete can mean an advocate, a defender. But it can also mean a comforter, someone who brings peace and comfort. And I want to bring that to the fore this morning because that aspect of the Holy Spirit is precisely what we find in Paul, who is no longer called Saul the persecutor, what we hear in his letter to the people of Rome. He writes to them that the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for human words. I use these words from Paul often during funeral services, because during those times we may not be sure how we ought to pray. During those times, we know what it means to feel sighs that are too deep for human words. And I want to bring this aspect to our attention this morning. Because the Holy Spirit, our paraclete, our advocate, our comforter, allows us to be transformed, not simply in the majesty and the power of that Pentecost event, speaking tongues. It allows us to be transformed not only when we are as full of faith as the disciples were said to be full of new wine, but the Holy Spirit allows us to be transformed when we are lost, when we are bereft, when we feel alone when we have more in common with the disciples after Jesus' crucifixion than we do with the disciples on Pentecost morning. 
Paul points to this work of the Spirit, a Spirit that comforts and provides hope. He compares it to the labor pains of something ready to be born, something that is ready to be born in this world through the work of the disciples, through the work of Christ, but also something that is ready to be born within ourselves. The hope that this Spirit this Comforter brings, reminds us that we are God's own, that we are known and cared for, and as precious to God as a lost coin is to a poor widow woman, or a lost sheep is to a shepherd. That hope can be hard to hold on to when we are going through trials, when the world mounts up around us and looms over us as if everything is about to fall in. In those days, we may not know how to pray as we ought. That's what makes this such an important reading for funerals. When we feel at a loss, when we feel at loose ends. But this is not a sentiment solely confined to funerals. This is as important as the tongues of fire. For the hope of Christianity is a hope not to be saved out of the circumstances of our lives, but to be born again within them. To act with power and perseverance and patience precisely when all seems lost. Precisely when we have been struggling for a year, wondering when we will come out the other side of this pandemic. It is especially important to recall in times such as these, when we look to the violence, the ongoing violence in Israel and Gaza, in a land that is called holy, which has been mired in a war that wears the clothing of religion, but is fundamentally about seeking violence and eradication of old enemies. It is a war fought by two people who are all too familiar with sides that are too deep for human understanding. What we can take this Pentecost is an understanding that the Spirit reaches out to us. The Spirit changes each person who is able to receive it. It strengthens people in times of trial. It enables the disciples to expand the reach of the church. But it also asks us to see ourselves as changed as well. It does not ask us to receive the Spirit and go on as if nothing had changed. It asks us to go out and share the good news of the Prince of Peace, of a God who seeks to bring comfort to all of God's people. That same Spirit asks us to be changed by sharing that good news with others, so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This Pentecost, may we worship the Holy Spirit sent to guide us and empower us. May we hear the Spirit speaking to us clearly, urging us to share God's justice with a world that is content to offer worship to the false gods of power and violence and death, the false gods of comfort and unfettered profit and disregard for human life. May we be bold, as those disciples were, to prophesy and to dream dreams. And may each of us who calls upon the name of the Lord find not only our own salvation, but the salvation of this world God loves so very much. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Come Down, O Love Divine.
Friends, as we prepare to go out this morning, remember that in moments of chaos, God is with us. In moments of calm, God is with us. In all of the moments of our lives, God is with us. So we go out as a Pentecost people, touched by holy fire, stirred by a holy wind, to mend this broken world that God so loves. Go in peace, my friends. Amen.